Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine, and in this video of the hemostasis series, I'll be discussing von Willebrand disease and the qualitative platelet disorders. The video's learning objective will be to discuss the pathogenesis, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, and treatment of these disorders. In response to endothelial injury in a vessel wall, platelets that are circulating in the bloodstream undergo the process of adhesion in which they either bind directly to exposed collagen or to previously circulating von Willebrand factor that's now immobilized on collagen via something called the GP1B95 complex. This binding triggers the process of platelet activation. Activation involves a number of changes in actions. This most notably includes the release of compounds into the surrounding blood, specifically more von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen, clotting factor V, ADP, and a compound called thromboxane A2. There is also a conformation change in the cell surface receptors for von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen, a receptor which also goes by the name GP2B3A. And there is also a change in the platelet shape, resulting in a more amorphous form with numerous projecting fingers of cytoplasm. This is not represented in the picture. Activation is followed by aggregation, in which von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen serve as bridges between adjacent platelets, resulting in the platelet plug. The platelet plug will then develop into a blood clot with the assistance of the coagulation cascade. Briefly about von Willebrand factor, it's a large circulating glycoprotein that is produced in platelets and endothelial cells. It exists as a heterogeneous mixture of multimers of various sizes linked by disulfide bridges. Von Willebrand factor also serves as a carrier protein for clotting factor 8, increasing its half-life in the circulation. So now, what is von Willebrand disease? Well, as you might suspect, it refers to the clinical entity that results from either qualitatively decreased and or dysfunctional von Willebrand factor. There are a large number of causative mutations, both in the von Willebrand factor gene, as well as in additional loci which may be involved in its secretion and post-translational modification. Von Willebrand disease is the most common inherited bleeding disorder. Reported prevalences vary greatly depending upon whether one considers only those patients with abnormal lab tests or also requires a history of clinically relevant bleeding for the diagnosis. Due to the complexity of von Willebrand disease, a classification system has been developed based predominantly on the pathogenesis. In type 1 disease, which accounts for roughly three quarters of patients, the defect is a quantitative one, in which the amount of von Willebrand factor present is less than normal. The inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant, and bleeding can range from non-existent to severe. In type 2 disease, which has four subtypes, the defect is qualitative, meaning that the von Willebrand factor levels are normal, but it doesn't work as well. Most of type 2 disease is autosomal dominant, while a minority is autosomal recessive. Bleeding in type 2 disease ranges from moderate to severe. In type 3 disease, there is a profound quantitative defect in which there is a total or near total absence of von Willebrand factor altogether. This is inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern, and the bleeding is always severe, being clinically similar to the disease hemophilia A. So when would a clinician suspect a patient might have von Willebrand disease? Sometimes the diagnosis is suspected in an asymptomatic patient with an abnormally high PTT test due to decreased levels of factor VIII. This could be discovered when a patient has screening coagulation tests checked before surgery, a practice which is actually controversial. But the most common symptomatic manifestations of von Willebrand disease are related to bleeding. The most common forms of bleeding seen in all subtypes are epistaxis, oral cavity bleeding, including excessive bleeding from dental work, excessive bleeding from minor cutaneous wounds, excessive post-operative bleeding, abnormally heavy or prolonged menstrual bleeding, known as menorrhagia, and postpartum hemorrhage. These latter two manifestations likely account for the observation that the disease is more commonly diagnosed in women than in men. Patients specifically with type 3 disease can also develop spontaneous muscle hematomas and hemarthrosis, which is bleeding into the joint space. Interestingly, 
spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage is not a common manifestation. Regarding the laboratory diagnosis of von Willebrand disease, patients usually have normal platelet counts. The PT should be normal, while the PTT may be either normal or prolonged. There are three specific tests for von Willebrand disease. The plasma von Willebrand factor activity, which is also known as the Ristocetin cofactor activity. Ristocetin is an antibiotic no longer used for this purpose due to its prominent side effect of causing thrombocytopenia and platelet aggregation by inducing von Willebrand factor to bind to GP1B. This effect is diminished in patients with von Willebrand disease. Another test is plasma von Willebrand factor antigen and factor VIII activity. Some additional specialized assays that can help to identify the subtype of disease include the von Willebrand factor multimer distribution and a test called ristocetin-induced platelet aggregation. By the time one is considering ordering these latter tests, the patient has usually already been referred to hematology. When it comes to the treatment for von Willebrand disease, it's usually reserved for patients with active bleeding or who are about to undergo surgery or other procedures which carry risk of significant bleeding, including labor. The management of pregnancy in patients with symptomatic von Willebrand disease represents a specific challenge that is preferably managed in consultation with a hematologist at a center experienced in high-risk pregnancies. Treatment options for von Willebrand disease more generally include desmopressin, also known as DDAVP. This is available in IV, subcutaneous, or intranasal routes of administration. Other options include concentrates of von Willebrand factor and factor VIII, as well as recombinant von Willebrand factor. These are typically only needed for patients with type 2 and 3 disease. Antifibrinolytic medications such as aminocaproic acid and tranexamic acid are also sometimes used. In addition to inherited von Willebrand disease, there is also a less well-known acquired form. There are several mechanisms that can lead to acquired von Willebrand disease, more commonly known as acquired von Willebrand syndrome. Each mechanism has a distinct list of potential etiologies. For example, a patient can have autoantibodies to von Willebrand factor. This can be seen in lymphoproliferative disorders, myeloproliferative disorders, and a variety of autoimmune diseases. Patients can have adsorption of von Willebrand factor onto cancer cells, and subsequent enhanced clearance. This is also seen in lymphoproliferative and myeloproliferative disorders. And patients can have shear stress-induced proteolysis of von Willebrand factor, which rarely occurs with severe aortic stenosis, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, with use of left ventricular assist devices, and in patients on ECMO. A diagnosis of acquired von Willebrand syndrome should be suspected when new onset mucosal bleeding occurs in a patient with a known predisposing condition and in whom the platelet count and prothrombin time are both normal. As with inherited von Willebrand disease, the PTT may be normal or high. Diagnosis can be confirmed by measuring von Willebrand factor activity, checking for von Willebrand factor antibodies, or testing factor VIII activity. Treatment options include von Willebrand factor concentrate, desmopressin, and if anti-von Willebrand antibodies are present, IVIG. The best long-term treatment of acquired von Willebrand syndrome is, of course, treatment of the underlying disorder. I'll now move on to discuss the qualitative platelet disorders. Unlike problems directly with von Willebrand factor, in which inherited disorders were much more common than acquired ones, acquired platelet dysfunction is much more common than inherited forms. Etiologies of acquired platelet dysfunction include medications such as aspirin, NSAIDs, and P2Y12 inhibitors, uremia, alcohol, liver failure, myeloproliferative diseases, and cardiopulmonary bypass. Excluding medications in which platelet dysfunction is usually the goal and not a side effect, uremia is the most common cause of clinically relevant platelet dysfunction. Importantly though, there is no specific degree of renal dysfunction at which bleeding risk starts to increase. The mechanism of uremic platelet dysfunction is complex and believed to be partially dependent on circulating toxins. However, urea itself is likely not one.
When it comes to the treatment of uremic platelet dysfunction, prophylaxis against bleeding is unnecessary aside from major upcoming surgical procedures. In patients who are experiencing active bleeding or in those about to undergo a major procedure, the most conventional treatment option is desmopressin again. In addition to directly treating the blood loss, transfusion of red blood cells has been shown to improve tests of platelet function. Cryoprecipitate, which contains von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen, among other coagulation factors, is sometimes used in life-threatening bleeding associated with uremia. And last, one might assume that if circulating toxins were thought partially responsible for uremic platelet dysfunction, that hemodialysis would be an appealing treatment strategy. While this is sometimes done and advocated for, in some patients, bleeding tests are actually acutely worsened by dialysis, and its role seems a little unclear to me. One treatment strategy which should not be employed is transfusion of platelets, since any new platelets introduced to the circulation will quickly become dysfunctional as well. Moving on to the inherited platelet disorders, as already mentioned, these are collectively rare. Their clinical presentations all share various forms of bleeding, which is often mucocutaneous, such as bleeding from the gums with toothbrushing, and seemingly spontaneous epistaxis. Thrombocytopenia may be present, but when it is, the bleeding is out of proportion to the degree of thrombocytopenia. Routine coagulation tests are normal, and tests for von Willebrand disease are negative. There are many different inherited qualitative platelet defects, but I'll focus on just the four most frequently discussed and tested. bernard soulier syndrome is due to a defect of platelet adhesion from a lack of the GP1B95 complex, also known as the von Willebrand factor receptor. One of its distinguishing features is giant platelets on a blood smear. Glanzmann thrombosthenia is due to a defect of aggregation on account of a lack of GP2B3A, also known as the fibrinogen receptor. MYH9-related disorder is caused by a defect in the MYH9 gene that encodes a non-muscle myosin heavy chain, resulting in a defect of the cytoplasmic structure and cell mobility of platelets. In addition to giant platelets, a blood smear can also reveal something called doli-like bodies within granulocytes. MYH9-related disease also has a number of manifestations unrelated to platelets, including hearing loss, pre-senile cataracts, and renal failure. Finally, in gray platelet syndrome, there is an absence of platelet alpha granules, which contain von Willebrand factor, factor V, and fibrinogen. On a blood smear, platelets are not only large, but are also gray in color, hence the name. Gray platelet syndrome is associated with myelofibrosis and splenomegaly. In all three of the disorders characterized by large platelets with low platelet counts, a situation also known as macrothrombocytopenia, automated cell counters may not consistently recognize the platelets due to their large size, and they may report even lower platelet counts than are actually present. That concludes this video on von Willebrand disease and the qualitative platelet disorders. The next video in this series on hemostasis will cover coagulation deficiencies such as hemophilia.